from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, swiping your card the new old-fashioned way, afraid of being against things, what's a divorcee to do at church, our picks of the week, so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. From 20 minutes into the future, it is time for the Catholic (laughs) Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 276. I am your humble host, Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on with us. Joining me this week, as they always do from 10 minutes in the past, Father Ryan Humphreys, the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. And you... Try again, Father. Hello, future. There it is. Wow. That's all right. <laughs> he was because stuck. it's ten seconds in the past, ten minutes in the past. You know, you have to yeah. adjust for pie. Yeah. Also, Kathleen Lee, the uh, campus minister at Saint Michael the Archangel High School in Baton Rouge, and she is our fully licensed faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Well, hi there. Also, we've got uh, Jeff Blackwell. He's a technical director of the CU. He's the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. Hello. So Jeff. I told him there's no way I'm doing that. Okay. <laughs> So, um, uh, when do we get started? <laughs> yeah, yeah, about uh, 10 minutes into the future. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good uh, to be here, Father. Good to be with you, Jeff. And, of course, we've got Mary-Kate, who is back on the video feed. Yay! Yay! That's right. Yay! Absolutely. She lives. She lives. She lives. We thought she was Frodo dead. Lives. But she lives. That's right. Frodo does live. Are we calling her Frodo? Is that a thing now? Are we doing that? No, mm. but it, it's that was what they said in the 60s. Indeed. Frodo lives. Yeah. yeah. They also mm. said I grok Spock, but we're not going to say that either. <laughs> I don't know. No. Anyway. No one knows that means. So, exactly. Except Bio Trimble. Uh, Amazon has launched a portable payment system to compete with Square. Now, are you familiar, Kathleen, with the Square Reader? I am. R- I, I, shocking, I know. I know the Square. I've got. I've got one in my book sack. Remember we talked about this last week uh-huh. about how the things you should have in your book sack? Yep. Yeah, he's always packing. Yeah. I, in fact, I had it downloaded on my phone for a while because I was... Yeah. Um, I have my square reader. It's this little itty-bitty square thing, and uh, it fits in your phone. Oh, look. Oh, wait. I've been looking for that. This is my other headphone uh, you know, earbud. <laughs> oh. Anyway, so it fits on your phone, and mm. you can slide a credit card through it. Yes. Uh, PayPal also has one. Well, now Amazon... Oh, okay. It's kind of old news now, but Amazon has launched a portable payment system to compete with Square. And uh, it's really kind of cool. The reason I keep the the, the Square reader in my book sack is, uh, say, for example, somebody wants to make a donation to Catholic Underground. Mm-hmm. We can do that. And they just slide their card. That's say covered. somebody wants to make a, a donation to me, the Father Chris Decker Fund for Father Chris Decker's personal advancement. They can do that, too. Um, or if, if uh, you have a product or a service, like, say, Jeff was charging for, I don't know, using his voice uh, to record voiceovers. Just shk, you run that through, and there it goes right into your bank account. I like that. That gives you 20 yeah. minutes of conversation with Jeff, and then, you know, if you, <laughs> when you get done, you have to swipe again. For 20 more minutes of conversation <laughs> yeah. with Jeff Blackwell. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. So, Father, uh, are are we all over this uh, this portable payment system from Amazon? Because they all kind of do the same thing, right? Yeah, there's not a dramatic difference between what exactly the way Amazon works and the way Square works. The big difference, though, is that some people have Square accounts, but everybody in the world has an Amazon account. And um, it, it's it's got some, some specific features that make it a little bit better than Square. And also, while Square may or may not come and go and PayPal may or may not be acquired, you have the sense that Jeff Bezos is always going to be somewhere. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there's just a sense of it's a nice large thing. Now, the, the fee is also a little bit smaller, but, uh, That's but how it's, they cut, it's just an undercut. interesting thing to do. And of course, I have a gift shop. And as we move more more and more uh, toward parishes, people wanting to make online contributions like this. So you're really kind mm-hmm. of almost wanting an usher to have a, a phone. They just swipe the amount and and go. You can see that being in the not, not too distant future. Um, you know, this becomes something. It's just nice to have more options in the field. Imagine how long the offertory would be <laughs> if we had a lot, whole lot of swiping going on in the pew. But if you had the usher before mass. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, this would be. Yeah, right. I, I wouldn't. I, yeah. And then now, I, now I've heard of this happening uh, with, with parishes that practice this online model of stewardship. Would they then, in the narthex of the church, uh, you know, swipe your card to get 
to get the the offering that you wish to make. And then you you give them like a little ticket or something that they would put in the offertory basket. Hmm. Well, I'm very seriously thinking about doing a little postcard size thing or slightly yeah. smaller yeah. where that has a QR code on it and a URL and they can go to that on their phone and make whatever contribution they want and then just write the amount in so they have something physically to put in the buy in the right. uh, collection basket. Exactly. So that you still you still are performing the important ritual act of placing something that is then carried unto the unto the altar. And you're if you're performing the important act of not being embarrassed when the basket walks by and you just there, kind of try not to make eye contact. There's that too. No, no, not yes. me. Not me. No. <laughs> I, I put something in. I promise. I just I, that was the other hand. I can't see. <laughs> Ken, Ken said uh, in the chat room. He says, uh, "Put one on the end of each pew. <laughs> just <a> little <laughs> sh- There you go. Please scan your card again. <laughs> Somebody's well, card is not working." With the new iPhone 6, I desperately want to have one of those cool little kiosk deals where you just kind of at the back of the church, yeah. beep, you know, just touch your phone to the device. That would be so awesome. Yeah. Have, have you noticed that uh, every, practically every store has a credit card swiper that, that they, they secretly, uh, secretly switched out to a sleeker one that I was wondering why all of them all of a sudden went to these new Verifone things, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's because it's near field communication capable. Well, what I'm really wondering is, is my, my iPhone will be in Tuesday. Thank you, Jesus. So I'll, I'll have it for Italy. <laughs> Jesus and had nothing I don't to know do with it. if it's going to qualify to do European payments or not. Oh, right. Um, because chip it. and pin is all over Europe. Everybody's yeah. using chip and pin. Everyone. But I don't know if this will do that. My, my hunch is you're still going to want to bring. Oh, I'm going to bring uh, credit cards. Physical but, plastic card. But cash, I just want to know if money. I can actually use yeah. Apple Pay in the Europe. Mm. I, Father Ryan. I appreciate what you're doing, but it's not going to work. But I want to try. Well, you can I try. I want to get screamed at by an Italian in a green jacket who says, no, 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 I guarantee no, 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 you, Father, you that use, will no happen. No, 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 it's impossible. That will happen at some point. <laughs> I, I live, whenever Father Ryan and I travel overseas, which has only been the one time that I'm aware no, we, of. Didn't we go another time? Didn't we? I thought we were going to go again in a week yeah, or totally. a month. So yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, Father Ryan... Father Ryan manages to get Europeans angry at him. Oh yes, it's kind of a charism. No. Yeah. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. I've it's been okay. screamed at twice in St. Peter's by guys in, in those masters jackets, those green. Uh, Meanwhile, I get coffee and biscuit. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are they going to do? They screamed at me, but what are they going to do? You know. Probably nothing. Uh, Clayton in the chat room says, "Strange fact: You can buy a pill case shaped like a square. It clips onto your smartphone, and nobody knows why." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because it's handy. You never know. You never know when you need your meds. Yeah. Or you could put the breath mint in there. Oh, yes. You know? Oh, yeah. get one of those green tea breath mints. Those are yummy. What? Oh, that's not normal. From the Trader no, Joe's? they're awesome. Really? Yeah, they're gr- you can get them at the Starbucks. Um, oh, wow. They're, they're little round know. boxes that make them look more pretentious and expensive. Oh. But they're little mints that taste like green tea. But I don't like the taste of green tea. I just drink it for the nutrients. Well, then I would expect that you wouldn't want to buy them. That's true. But mm. I thoroughly enjoy it. <laughs> They're delightful. I don't know. I don't know about all that. If you're still watching <laughs> or listening, <laughs> it's we the Catholic Underground. We devolved a little quick win to see you later there. Yeah, my Eight goodness. Into uh, the show. But by the way, we're on the air right now live. If you're in your home or, or in your car and you're still listening, uh, this is actually a show that we do. Uh, it happens. It's true. You are listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker, joined by Father Ryan Humphreys over Skype. Jeff Blackwell and Kathleen Lee join us, as they always do. Um, our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, I think it's time we moved on to the next topic. Uh, <laughs> Monsignor <laughs> Charles Pope, who is in the Archdiocese of Washington. Is that correct? He is. That's yes. right. He has a great post on our social fear of being against things. And this seems to be... Uh, something that is more and more prevalent in our society. Um, whenever somebody stands up, usually on YouTube or Facebook, and says, I am not for this, it usually incites a, a riot of some kind, at least a flame war in a comm box. Yep. Right, because people people nowadays don't know how to be disagreed with. You know, mm-hmm. they get very, very upset. And so Monsignor Pope's argument is simple enough that people prefer to be thought of as for something rather than against something. Mm. But we're a fad-worshipping society, and so people also want to be thought of 
as into or in favor of whatever's new and hip. And so as the world gets more and more messed up, there's a lot of things that we we, we simply have to be against yeah. um, as Christians and as frankly as people who are not insane. And so, um, you know, and, and this is not just Christians. Mashable, the very non-Christian website, yeah. has been recognizing a phenomenon of people um, who are self-censoring their opinions when they find that they don't agree with the predominant majority opinion. They just don't want to get into it. And if they can't say I'm for something, they simply don't want to get involved at all. You know? I tend and to so be guilty of that. The, that's right. Yeah. And so uh, even even Bill Crazy Pants Mayor uh, is asking whether the people who are perceived as enlightened have brains in their head because they refuse to stand up. They're censoring themselves on things like Islam. Mm-hmm. And, and so, for example, it's, it's better marketing to be pro-life than to be anti-abortion. Um, and that marketing has actually created this kind of silly effort to explain pro-life as something more substantial than anti-abortion, which it is. But at the sure. same time, the whole purpose of the movement is to stop legalized abortion. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not about trying to fit everything into one kind of obscure banner. And you have the same thing with like, you know, well, I want to be pro-traditional marriage, but you can be in favor of regular marriage and then be in favor of unnatural marriage at the same time. So you know, the hardest thing for us to remember is that Jesus was against a lot of stuff yeah, and not in favor of something else, but against this and this is wrong. And, and so it becomes a, a difficult place for us to be where the world doesn't want anybody to be against anything. Yeah. And yet we have kind of a moral obligation in some cases to say, no, 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 I may be for all manner of things, but abortion is wrong. Mm-hmm. Contraception is wrong. Unnatural marriage is wrong. And then you you kind of get into a situation where you say, I'm sorry, I'm for a bunch of stuff. But in this case, I'm against something you're for. And if you can't handle that, well, then we're just going to have to disagree. Yeah. And and one of the things that happens very often is, especially I know uh, when we speak about uh, the priesthood, Father Ryan, is part of our professional job is to be against things that are morally wrong to be against mm-hmm. things that are sinful, to be against things that cannot, do not point towards Jesus Christ. And while I may not get into those um, arguments online, because, well, frankly, I don't have time to sit in front of a computer and defend myself all day long, uh, or defend the church for that matter, I will do that in a parish setting. You know, certainly. Uh, the homily is a good example to say, well, this is Catholics. So we are against this. We are. We are against this. Um, and then to, to suffer the repercussions of that, because I know it's hard to believe, and Kathleen, I know you probably have never experienced this before, but, uh, but even in a church community, we're called to be of one mind and one heart, which is the same that was in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, but, <laughs> but yet we are not. And so when a priest stand, stands up, or a teacher for that matter stands up and says, no, we are against this, you're very often met with um, at least some askance looks. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a there's a, a disconnect. Like every time I say, "Hey, I'm against abortion," mm-hmm. well, obviously I hate I hate pregnant women. Uh, right. Or you know, every time I say, "Well, I'm, I'm against," you know, the act of homosexuality. Well, then then I hate all of those who have same sex attraction. Same-sex. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm, that's right. It doesn't mean that I hate anybody. Right. It just means that there are things that that I can't be for that I right. can't agree with. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that. When we start to learn that, mm-hmm. you know, we can disagree with what we with what each other do. Yeah. Um, but we still love the person. Things might get a little bit and, clearer. And that's really the the concept is I think we we do not understand what these mean love. Mm-hmm. We don't know what love means anymore, and so we tend to make a hard line that love is this, hate is this. Yeah. If you do not condone, you do not love. Right, mm-hmm. because uh, who am I to judge is the phrase that's often levied around. You know, and you you can't judge anybody. Don't uh, just be tolerant of them. Yeah. And if you are not tolerant of them, wherever they find themselves, uh, if you don't agree with it, uh, then you must hate them. Mm-hmm. And that's really not that's not what we believe as Christians. It's certainly not what we believe. But sometimes we we get painted in that that either or. Uh, but there's more to it than either or, isn't there, Father? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the thing I always think about when it comes to love is I always say, you know, let's look at the works of mercy that are that are there in the scripture. And once we start talking about the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, sure. and we start talking about John 15, 14, and we start talking about there's no greater love than that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then, of course, when we climb into those spiritual works of mercy and we get to number three, yeah. everybody starts getting nauseated and eyes, eye contact starts going away because the spiritual works of mercy are to instruct the ignorant. Well, that's not that hard. To counsel the doubtful, that's not really all that tough. If we skip number three, it's to say, okay, well, we bear wrongs patiently. That's a little harder. Forgive offenses. That's a little harder still. To comfort the afflicted, we can do that. Pray for the living and the dead. Okay, any of those we can do. But number three is to admonish sinners. Mm -hmm. And so if I believe someone is doing something that's going to put their soul in peril, yeah. then I've got a moral obligation to go up to them and challenge and admonish them. Yeah. And that's real love. And boy, people do not like that. Yeah. And and uh, as, as priests, sometimes the place that we, we are kind of forced into doing it is during the celebration of the liturgy. I mean, how many times uh, as priests have we had to correct a behavior? Um, certainly in charity and in love, um, but the the way that it's presented is right there, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I've had to instruct people in the communion line. I've had to instruct people um, as the opening hymn is beginning, and I should be walking up the, the aisle, you know, processing in for Mass. Um, I certainly have to instruct the people from the ambo. That's part of what a priest does. Mm -hmm. But it's like any time uh, time you have to address something uh, in, in terms of uh, this is my job as a priest is to be concerned about your soul it's often met with uh, with well reaction outright <laughs> reaction how dare you you know yeah and that's tough it's tough uh, I know Jeff um, as, a, as a quote unquote new Catholic you joined uh, you, you you reconnected with your Catholic roots huh um, in 1990. And yes. part of part of what we must do as Catholics is is stand up for what we believe. Yes, you know, and sometimes that means that you're going to be. W would you say that you were shunned by people whenever you stood up and said, "I'm a Catholic"? Uh, I was, but it was mainly uh, b because people in my uh, in my past, my friends in your former are, are ecclesial Protestant. community. <laughs> there yeah. you go. That's mm -hmm. what, yeah, I love the way you put it. But uh, yeah, and, and and it is difficult because they don't understand. And I had one uh, one gentleman, uh, for example, got in got into uh, and, uh, and really it got heated at one point. Yeah, uh, which I have learned since it's better just to say, listen, I'll find out more details when mm -hmm. I can talk about it in a calm fashion and get back to you. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he was uh, just going like, well, you know, Mary went on to have kids and stuff. It says so in the Bible. Yeah. And it's like, okay, even if that was true, <laughs> does that make her any less of a virgin when she had Jesus? Right. And, uh, there are all sorts of divine revelation things yeah, that we so, have to agree on. That's a, yeah. But anyway, I got off point there. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I had some folks who were not happy. But uh, I finally found what I was looking for is basically the only way I can put it. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. And when, and, and when we in the church have found the pearl of great price. We sell all that we have, even our own, um, our own reputations, <laughs> you know, and we buy it. We, we do. And that's the beautiful thing. Uh, mm. Ah, yes. So uh, let us know what you think, certainly, um, about being anti-things, right? About being against things. Backchat at catholicunderground.com is the place to do that. And you can join uh, people uh, in the chat room. Who, who are certainly talking about this as well. Um, uh, Taylor in the chat room says, there are many times when I say I'm against abortion or against same-sex marriage, and the response I get is that I can't call myself, uh, uh, I shouldn't call myself a Christian. And again, that uh, certainly is contradictory, you know. Or, mm -hmm. or she says, I'll get told that because you're a Catholic and Catholics hate all non-Catholics and mm -hmm. people living by non-Catholic standards. Well, that bespeaks that there is a standard. <laughs> You know, that's a good point. Who determines the standard? Yeah. And yeah. if I am the standard bearer in myself, um, then naturally, whenever something uh, is is absolutely not right, yeah. um, I have to I have to determine what that is myself. So that's what why what what would Jesus do? Brace would drive me bonkers. <laughs> you know, because you, you, the, yeah, the idea is nice. Okay, sure, Jesus is over your shoulder, but at the same time, how arrogant do you have to be to say I know what Jesus would do? Yes. I mean, that that's <laughs> tough. You know, I mean, as a Catholic theologian and as a priest, I rarely have ever have to extrapolate and say I wonder what Jesus would say in this because the church has said it. 
not yeah. me. And so I look and say, well, the church says no to contraception. The church says no to this, that, or the other. You know, and people go, well, you think this? I say, oh, <laughs> this <laughs> no, is no. not me talking. <laughs> this is me translating what the church says, but I'll show you in the catechism where this is what we believe. Right. But but this is not me coming up with some brilliant idea. And the idea that somebody walking around with a little yellow bracelet on their arm somehow magically knows how Jesus Christ would react in any given situation with no training, no instruction, no catechism to work from, yikes. That's oh, a kind but, of narcissism that even I can't pull off, and I'm incredibly <laughs> arrogant. But, but Father Ryan, is isn't the catechism and in, uh, man's interpretation that that's uh, not the divinely inspired word from God? He's baiting you, no. Father. He's baiting you. No, because no, no. no, uh, I've heard in this a, before a, in Catechesi Tredendi, Pope uh, Pope John Paul II, and in the other uh, document where he specifically promulgated it, uh, made it very clear that this is this is a it's it's an expression. So it is not an infallible expression of the Church's teaching, mm -hmm. but that which is expressed is itself the result of the magisterium acting. You know, in in its in its definitive way, and so it is not infallible teaching, mm. but it is definitive teaching. And so, theoretically, someone could come later on and say, "Okay, yeah, the wording of this is not really as sharp as we want it to be." But in terms of what the church teaches in any one of those topics, that's what we believe. There you go. Ken in the chat room has the Jesus prayer on a wristband. That's really that's much cool. better. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm, that, I like that much better. That is a wristband worthy of wearing mm -hmm. because it's very definitive it says exactly yeah what jesus would do <laughs> it's just a I lot like of letters like that's right it's a lot it's a lot of <laughs> that's right at any rate uh it's catholic underground oh i i had music but it's gone now oh well oh, oh you, you uh, okay oh i'm I, sorry jeff Yes. We're still on a live radio program, if you can believe, believe it. It, it is not. a live radio program. Yay. And you know how it's live? Because we can do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the Catholic Underground. What's the matter, Father? Another wheel coming off over there? <laughs> Clap, Clap if you can't, can't whistle. whistle. <laughs> we are one big inside joke, and we call ourselves the Catholic Underground. Uh, I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining us, Father Ryan Humphreys on Skype. We've got uh, Kathleen Lee, who sits to my left, which is yep. your right. We've also got Jeff Blackwell. Who's and goofing up tonight? Eh? It's it's all right. Actually, <laughs> in, in all truth, uh, I didn't give Jeff the high sign, like in my brain, I thought. And I've I been had. distracted. i got a computer that's got some problems over here to the side. So that's there we've, we've confessed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> te absolvo. At any rate, uh, we're going to move on with uh, this, uh, this cavalcade, this wagon train to the stars. Uh, liturgical impoverishment. If you can imagine, liturgical a, a poorness in the liturgy is a major detriment for the divorced and remarried. And we're not just talking about the mass here, right, Father? Right. And this is this is something I read this this uh, article some months uh, maybe a month ago, and I looked at it. And I said, "Well, this is just crazy talk. This is another you know just super traditional person, Father William Oddy over there in in the UK." And I read it, and I went. By God, he's on to something. Um, Father Adi is a, is a British priest who has the same name as Bill Adi, the comedian, but is not the same person. I, I got that confused, too. Um, but he realized two entirely obvious things and put these two obvious things together. First, people who are divorced and remarried, they're not divorced, you know, the, who, who are both divorced and remarried. Civilly. Civilly are in a state of public sin and cannot receive Holy Communion because in the eyes of the church, you're still married to the first person, so you can't receive Holy Communion. That's obvious to everybody. Second, since Vatican II, the church doesn't really do anything prayerful that doesn't involve Mass, at least nothing officially. There are a couple of prayer cynicals. You might have a, a charismatic prayer group. There might be a rosary group. But, but I mean, good in the church, this, in a public way, Yeah, a good example of this might be whenever people say, uh, Father, can we have a Mass for such and such? And it's, you know, uh, perhaps a little obscure group or something of that nature. There's, there's no sense of, can we do morning or evening prayer, but can we have a special Mass just for this particular event? Exactly. Right. And, and that di hasn't been the case for a long time. But Father Adi, the duh moment here is in the two-part question, well, why did we stop doing all that prayerful stuff that doesn't involve Holy Communion and therefore doesn't alienate 
-hmm. all the people who can't receive Holy Communion, which is not just divorced and remarried, but it's non-Catholics. Yeah. It's people who are considering becoming Catholics. It's people who um, have an eating disorder and have to eat every four minutes and can't fast before communion. It's all kinds of people. Yeah. Um, and he said, well, why can't we start doing those things again? And those things include, as you mentioned, Father, morning prayer, the liturgy of the hours, or vespers, as we call them, evening prayer, um, novenas in the church, preached novenas, parish missions, processions, holy hours, any number of these kind of traditional activities that had been done, some on the small scale and some on quite the large scale, mm -hmm. um, that were an ordinary part of our parish life in the United States for a long time, and yet now are completely abandoned in favor of either mass or if Father's not available, a liturgy of the word, mm -hmm. um, which makes people feel awkward because it's basically the mass, but without the mass. And so people look and go, well, I'm kind of getting gypped here. It'd be better if we got the mass. And so, you know, Father's point is basically, you know, we because we've taken away all this liturgical stuff that is not mass, we've basically left every service someone can go to as as making people who cannot receive communion feel alienated and mm -hmm. offended and not part of the community, which is simply not the case, but it's a heck of a strong point. Yeah, it's it's kind of an outcropping of, uh, of what Taylor said in the chat room. Uh, you're Catholic, and Catholics uh, hate all non-Catholics and, and people living by non-Catholic standards. Well, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. That's not what we believe, you know. Uh, but I think whenever... We, we, we make the Mass, in a sense, an exclusive thing because it is an exclusive thing to who we are as Catholics. Um, you must fully understand the fullness before you can really begin to, to receive every amount of grace that God wants to give you in that moment that is the Mass. And so there are all of these other ancillary things that, that point to that that are accessible by all and even points of contact by all, you know? And I often wonder that myself. You know, Father, whenever you and I were in the seminary, we, we uh, had many a class that tried to um, get to the bottom of what the, the diocesan priest's spirituality is. What is the spirituality of a priest in a diocese in a parish and not a priest who's a monk in a monastery somewhere? And to me, it would seem like this is really kind of part of the core, not only of the identity of the laity as Catholics, but also our identity as priests uh, as well. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I also think that that it's such a big part of the question because priests are, are walking a pretty fine line. I mean, we've got to defend and protect the sacraments. We've got to follow the law of the church. Yeah. But we also have all these these sheep that we want to, to see brought into the fold. We sure. want people to be brought back. And in some cases, it's not possible to do that with an annulment. Mm -hmm. And it's not possible to do that in an easy way. And so we've got to start thinking, well, what more does the church offer? And, and I used to have a bishop, a former bishop of this diocese, who used to say, we can never be narrower than the church nor wider than the church. Right. And so we look around and we say, well, what does the law of the church allow? What does the sacraments of the church allow that can make people who are not able to receive communion feel like they're part of the show? Yeah. And uh, and there's, there's a lot of good ways to do that. And unfortunately, we just kind of kind of shut off the pipe on those. And, and you know, I have to add too, Father, because this is just one of my pet peeves. The idea of row by row communion mm -hmm. drives me bonkers. Because I remember as a layperson when I would be unable to receive communion, maybe I came in late and I'd eaten breakfast or something like that. When the row by row communion starts going, if I don't receive communion, you everybody's get, looking, go, what did that guy do? You get the stare. Mm -hmm. We yeah. all know the I mean, stare. And so when we get this kind of this habit of row by row communion and everybody has feels like this push to go out, it creates this kind of sense of like like with the collection envelope before, there's a sense of embarrassment where it should be a sense of generosity, not mm -hmm. a sense of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and of course the way they do it in Rome, the joke is, you know, for those who haven't been to Rome, the joke <laughs> is when it comes time for communion, you grab a veil and hold on for dear life. You That's just right. grab on a nun and you just go and she That's drags right. you to wherever communion's <laughs> happening. It's true. Because it's certainly not at the front of the church. It's no. everywhere. It's everywhere. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's chaos. Yeah. So so what would be what would be the um the alternative to the row by row, just kind of everybody getting up at once and figuring out where the communion station is. Well, I I, I think that we could do it with with if even if just the ushers went away. Yeah. You know, just the ushers go away, and the and if, as I'm, I'm very seriously considering this in my parish, saying we're not going to do row by row. You come forward as you're ready. If you want to take an extra moment of prayer, do that. If you feel like you want to be first in line, go ahead and come along. 
be courteous and polite and we're going to have the usual communion stations at the front, but we're not going to do this, you know, the usher staring down going, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you know, that that's got to go. Um, you know, I, I just think it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous precedent. We've got into this kind of very mechanical mindset and that's taken charity away yeah. and it's taken the volition away and it's replaced it with a sense of this is what we do. This is our tradition. And it's, it bears fruit in the kind of idiocy of, well, we're all going to stand together after communion as an act of intimacy or act of unity or something like that, that mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's so such a distortion of, of what the church's mind is when it comes to being a part of a community. Yeah. I mean, um, Kathleen, you're, you're in a, a parish from week to week mm -hmm. and you, you know, I mean, because we, we know the people with whom we go to mass Right. And, you know, I would imagine there are probably some people who, who for one reason or another, maybe there is an annulment pending. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they, uh, who knows, any number of cases where, where they, they can't receive Holy Communion. Um, wh what are some of your thoughts? I think, I mean, I think it definitely takes real courage to not go, mm -hmm. you know, to, to not, to sit and stay. Yeah. Um, and, but I've also been in, um, like, foreign countries. In, Me in Latin America, they do this a lot. Where they just everybody goes to communion. Yeah, and same time. Just it's awesome mm -hmm. because it because I think that a lot of times in church, you know, it's kind of what we've been talking about. Just the idea of efficiency overrules the idea of. Am of I right with the Lord? Yeah, of liturgy <laughs> yeah. And, and rightness, and so, um, you know, I have a lot of liturgical. You know, just because I, I'm friends with a lot of priests who um, who do it well. Um, you know, whenever whenever I feel rushed through mass. You know, when it comes to that, mm -hmm. everybody get up, everybody walk, everybody, mm -hmm. you know, um, it loses a lot of its its sacredness, I think. So I agree with, with Father Ryan. Yeah, and of course, in a perfect world, we wouldn't be constrained, and this is one of the things you certainly get in Italy, uh, we wouldn't be constrained to just an hour. Father, if you're not done with whatever it is you're doing in an hour, then we're out. You know? Yeah, it is. It's fairly disturbing. I mean, you, if that bell rings, because I've got the big church bells, yeah. and if they go off <laughs> Me to strike the hour... <laughs> mm -hmm. People are looking and going, are we still here? Right. I mean, are we still here seriously? <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, they think, let's get done. Let's get done now. Yep. And so that bell, like Asimov, <laughs> like Asimov's nightmare, begins to train we priests. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that, and this is funny, this is the, the inner workings of, of, uh, of Father Celebrates the Mass. Mm -hmm. I know that if the quarter till bell rings and I'm not to the Agnus Day yet, I preach too long. <laughs> oh. Or I need to, you know, yeah, I need to move a little, a, a little quick, quick, more quickly a pace. Otherwise, I start to get the looks, and you know, and even even priests are not completely immune from that. I have never gotten a watch tap, but the moment I get a, the moment I get a watch tap, you can bet I'm going to call it out. Yeah. Oh, you go ahead. I oh, would. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I think that that reclaiming some of the devotional life of the parish is very much uh, an opportunity where not only can a parish come more alive, but it can begin to minister to those sheep, if you will, who maybe have a wound and, and they're not quite ready to come into the paddock, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that really could be more an act of mercy than just pretending that everybody is, is free and clear to receive Holy Communion, you know? And I, I got to tell you that uh, I, I'm a little more compassionate understanding now yeah. uh, than when I first became Catholic. And uh, it's because my dear sweet dad um, uh, went to church with mom for like a couple of years. And, and of course, when it came time for communion, he would, he would sit in the pew. Um, but he converted at the age of 81. So there's, you know, there's always uh, hope. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's just great. No matter when you come into the vineyard, you know, yeah. when the Lord calls you, you go to work. And he gives you what is just. Yeah. Salvation. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> that's clever. <laughs> yeah, you like that? Amen. That's awesome. I think that's really, <laughs> really awesome. All right. Well, um, you are listening to the Catholic Underground. We are we are moving um, roughshod through our our hour show, but I think it's a wonderful thing. I'm Father Chris Decker. We've got Father Ryan Humphreys over on Skype. Jeff Blackwell joins us, as does Kathleen Lee and Mary-Kate Taylor. All right, we're going to move uh, straight into the Catholic's Divorce Survival Guide to keep with a little bit of the theme. And, uh, and Kathleen, um, you are our 
I was going to say, are you our resident? My re- I, look. No, you're not a divorcee. No. You're just no, single. I'm not even, I am single. And you are available. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, I, she I mean, is. She is who is available. I am. And so, but anyway, this is a really cool thing. Um, it's a website. It's a community. It's a DVD, a group um, mm-hmm. organization program that tries to assist uh, Catholics who are going through divorces. Yeah. Um, and it looks really good. You know, it's, it's one of those subjects that I know um, is kind of, you know, talking about not being yeah. for something. It says right on the website, it yeah. says you're not alone. There's yeah. no such thing as Catholic divorce, but the bad news is Catholics do civilly divorce. We're there to help yeah. and encourage healing through the sacraments where you'll personally encounter Christ and all his love and tender mercies. And that's the really good news. Yeah. That's a great thing to put on the front of your website. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's something that's so, so prevalent, you know, divorce nowadays um and so a lot of people need you know a lot of people would rather just go and get divorced and not really be connected to the church you know they the the church is something that they could give or take yeah and so they they give it back yeah yeah. (laughs) you know um and and they don't get an annulment and then you know they want to get married later on and it's all this it's it's just a mess and it becomes a mess right yeah so and so this program looks really really good just um you know um, there, there's a you can get it for your parish, or you can also get it on an individual basis, and it comes with, um, you know, a lot of things like some DVDs, um, some workbooks, just some some stuff, some resources that you can use. And that's mm-hmm. what I love. You know, I was talking to somebody about about something else, but what I love about what we say at um, at Catholic Community Radio is that um, when you listen to Catholic Radio, when you listen to this, yeah. this, you know, podcast, not our program, of course, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's something that you can listen to, even our program on a, you know, on a, on, on a good day. On a yeah, mm, well, <laughs> you know, it's something that is really not intrusive. Yeah, no. You can just plug it in. You plug your earphones in. You could have be walking down the street, and nobody knows that you're listening right. to Catholics. I mean, if you want to tell people, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, but for this, you know, if you want to learn more about what, um, you know, what the church says about divorce, what can you do? Yeah. Um, to get an annulment, um, it's something that. You know, you don't have to put out there. Right. Um, that you can bring it into your home, and it really yeah. helps you get through uh, through what you're going through. It's like in the back of the church, I have a whole series of brochures from our Sunday visitor, and one of them is what the church teaches on annulments. And more than any other brochure, that one is the one that gets mm-hmm. that gets plucked. I have to reorder that one more often because everybody's always wondering. Mm. And so CatholicsDivorce.com to me seems like a really good thing because even on the front page of their website, they have a whole bunch of common questions like, we're only separated, now what? Why do I hurt so much? I don't trust the church and I haven't been to Mass for years. Where can I learn more about Catholicism? Mm -hmm. How do I handle my difficult ex? Help, I'm drowning in debt. These are all questions that come Mm. up, not just for a Catholic Yes, but anybody who's going through the difficulty, and and let me just say on behalf of priests everywhere, there's not a one of us, I dare say, not a one of us, who thinks for a minute that that divorce isn't real, <laughs> and there's not a one of us who who doesn't uh, feel great great um, sadness because you are hurting, and I think I I would like to say I could speak for every priest. Sometimes we get painted as, you know, well, since there's no such thing as Catholic divorce, you priests don't care. No, we care more about you because we know that you're hurting, Right. you know. Yeah. So uh, this is a really neat. Uh, yeah. And so this is, you can get it for, start a parish group. You yeah. can go through it on your own. Yeah. And on the website, you can um, find a parish group. In fact, I, oh, that's neat. I typed in our um, zip code and there's one here in Baton Rouge that's, you know, one wow. of our churches here in Baton Rouge is doing it. Um, so this is great. I think it's it's excellent. What I love about our church is that um, you know, when people always say that we just say you, know, you can't get divorced and that's it. Mm-hmm. What our church says is no, 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 no. There's so this is why this is this is why we teach what we teach and, and this is really that in action. Yeah. You know, um, not just some encyclical that's stored away, but um, you know, the the teachings of the church put into practice and made accessible. So I think it's it's really cool. That's really neat. Uh, you know, before we get to our personal picks of the week, we also have a, an organization and one more product to recommend. Kind of like CatholicsDivorce.com, there's a, a really neat confraternity. Now, Father, confraternities are something that went out with the bathwater, and thankfully, they're back. 
Yeah, they, they're basically just spiritual organizations that you have kind of a, a perfunctory membership in. So you enroll in them. They generally require some specific prayers to be done daily or weekly, and they have specific spiritual promises that are given uh, usually by the Holy See, yeah. uh, and they're connected typically with some kind of, of particular kind of spiritual devotion. So a Holy Name Society would be at a parish organization, and, and a, that, that's a group of parishioners that just want to see spiritual events funded. You might have a confraternity of Christian mothers. You might have a confraternity uh, like the Blue Army that wants to encourage the rosary. Mm -hmm. You might have a, a confraternity of altar boys. The Children of Mary is a confraternity of young women. And so it's just it's, it's, a, it's a broad kind of category of people. And the Angelic Warfare Confraternity, uh, as Jeff is going to tell us, was reestablished by the Dominicans. Oh, 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 I am, huh? <laughs> because I was just telling Father, you know, I, I had heard, I didn't realize these were called confraternities. Yeah. Well, we uh, call them so. parish groups now okay. because they're not connected with, as Father Ryan was saying, uh, the, the, the benefits of being instituted uh, by an organization that is then connected with some spiritual benefits by the Holy Father or the major of a religious order or something like that. So I know there is a website, yep. uh, Angelic Warfare Confraternity. Dot .org. Uh, uh, dot .org, okay. Yep. Uh, so uh, it, it is an apostolate mm -hmm. of the Dominican Friars, as Father Ryan said. Yep. But can you enlighten us, Father Ryan? That's right, you, you have to join. Oh. Yeah, in fact, I'm I'm one of the people that has been uh, deputed to enroll people because you oh, have to be deputed so? formally by the Eastern Province Dominicans because they're the the only ones that have the authority. Okay. Um, but it, it was established originally by St. Thomas Aquinas 800 years ago. And a membership requires simply being enrolled. And the enrollee promises to pray a few specific prayers daily, uh, some Our Father's Hail Marys and then some specific prayers. And basically, you're praying for yourself and all the other members of the confraternity to be sexually pure, um, to, to be protected against uh, temptations to pornography, masturbation, uh, fornication, etc. And it's a remarkably great thing. And the Dominican friars have been having wild success with it. Um, um, you know, people who've experienced addiction to various sexual things for years, mm -hmm. uh, calling up and saying they've been a member of the fraternity for six months, a year, and they've been going cold turkey now for this long and have had no relapse and, and the prayers, they just mm -hmm. feel how powerful they are. Uh, so it's an incredibly good confraternity devoted to the angelic purity okay. um, because St. Thomas Aquinas was the angelic doctor. And so uh, so it's a fascinating group and it's uh, angelicwarfareconfraternity.org for more okay. information. Yeah, and another one that I would mention, uh, that of which I'm a member, is the Militia Immaculata, uh, a worldwide evangelization movement founded by St. Maximilian Kolbe. And I think we should get Jeff and all of our Catholic radio folks uh, enrolled. And uh, basically, it encourages total consecration of the Blessed Virgin Mary as a means of spiritual renewal for individuals and for society. So if you're seven, year olds or, uh, seven years old or up, uh -huh. you can become a member of the Militia Immaculata, as I have. And that is also another... Um, I don't know if they would consider it a confraternity. It certainly has a, a papal approbation. I don't know. What it's a sodality. It's a sodality. That's what it's called. Very, very, very <laughs> similar, remember. but not yeah. worth getting into all the specific details. That's right. Makes it different. But also has spiritual benefits uh, for its members. Right. And, and I will tell you that these things are real. Once you join a sodality or a confraternity or an arch confraternity and you begin praying for her members and their members start praying for you, things start happening. It's It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, so, so the Angelic Warfare Confraternity is one of them. Militia Immaculata is another. Militia um, Immaculata. And that's at, that's at marytown.com or consecration.com. Uh, I wonder if consecration.com is actually working. Nope, not yet. Um, on the Feast of St. Maximilian Kolbe, apparently somebody had uh, had it on TV because they got dig affected. They, they, uh, right now, they're with, their website's down. Oh. So maybe I should call them. At any rate, Hello. Uh, <laughs> there is a new chastity series uh, that focuses on real love, love as real love. Remember we said earlier in the show that we tend to kind of mm -hmm. boil love down to emotion, just yeah. erotic love, eros. Uh, but actually, there, there's more to love than just erotic love. There, there's philios, huh? the, the actual loving of another person uh, for, their, for your mutual benefit. And then agape, right? There's mm -hmm. this notion of laying down your life for another. Well, chastityproject.com um, has uh, a lot of information here on, on trying to focus on especially uh, for, for young people um, th this notion of becoming a young disciple. 
And so uh, Chastity Speaker Jason Everett, and I believe his wife as well, mm-hmm. uh, have started ChastityProject.com. I bet, Kathleen, you've talked about this before. Uh, not not this, this one specifically, but I've definitely yeah. talked about ChastityProject.com because yeah. they're pretty legit. Yeah. Yes. And, and so uh, there, this is another thing, kind of like the Catholic Divorce Program, mm-hmm. where you can uh, follow this individually or you can follow it in a group and start a group in your parish. And uh, this is a pro- program whose goal is to represent what chastity is, the virtue of chastity. Often thought of kind of this repressive thing, you know, this neurotic idea of sexuality, unhealthy requirements and things like that. But uh, this emphasizes that chastity orders one's life. It helps you build your relationship with members of the opposite sex. It helps your relationship with God. And it helps you to, to truly cultivate what I call my favorite beatitude, because it's oriented towards the sacred heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Mm. Uh, so that's a, a really, really beautiful thing. And that's over at chastityproject.com. Chastityproject.com. And uh, why disciple? The letter Y, disciple.org. There's a starter kit, uh, 120 bucks for the boys' version, 120 bucks for the girls' version. And if you want to move into the digital platform, maybe for your parish, it's, uh, I think, 1200 a year for that. So this is something that a, a parish wow. that could really get into. And really, you could begin to use this as a model for maybe some of your youth ministry or plug it into if you have a life team program or something. That would be kind of cool. I'm actually using it as a significant part of the sex ed program for our uh, high schoolers. Oh, yeah? At St. Mary's, yeah. I have to let me know how it goes because uh, we're using the chosen program for our confirmation, mm-hmm. uh, but there's also like a a ninth and tenth grade version of the chosen program that includes some of the the chastity and abstinence uh, and and sexual identity sort of piece. And so let me know, Father, how that goes. Uh, this is because it's very good. That's one of the things I love about 2014, where mm-hmm. we are here yes. in the church is there are so many resources. In fact, I would dare say that the market is beginning to saturate with all these different resources yeah. for confirmation, for chastity, for youth ministry. And they're all very good. Mm-hmm. At least a good number of them are, at least a lot of the ones that I've seen that are available. All righty, folks. Well, it's that time of the program. Uh, you've managed to make it this far, so you might as well go with us another mile. It's time for... The CU Pick of the Week. All righty. We've somehow made it to the CU Pick of the Week. <laughs> yes, we have. Yeah, Father Ryan uh, is sneezing yeah, in the I'm background. So, I, I tried to push show. the button, it didn't happen. Bless That's okay. you, Father Ryan. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. We won't go to him first for the Pick of the Week. Uh, how about we go to Jeff because you've got a lot to talk about. Oh, I am so excited about this. Uh, actually, uh, Father Chris and I uh, made a little field trip this week out to Presonus. Yep. They're right here in, in the capital city of Louisiana. Uh, yes, and it's an international company. They uh, really uh, have, have tons of electronic-type gear uh, for studio, live sound, and uh, musicians. So we um, have been uh, eyeing some equipment, and one that came, and, and in fact, I don't even think it's uh, distributed yet. It's so brand new. Uh, is their RM series of mixers. And uh, those of you who, even for a church, I think this is uh, pretty neat because there are so many presets and, and uh, scenes that you can save. Um, and this is a very affordable way to yeah. you know, uh, introduce a mixer. Uh, even though it, it's platform, uh, it really is stuck in the rack. Yeah. It's a 32-channel mixer, active integration, meaning that uh, it, with Wi-Fi you can address it, uh, Cat5, Firewire. Uh, multi-track recording. It's got so many literal thousands of settings. Yeah. What they call fat channels, which uh, basically on each input you can uh, you can have compressors, um, uh, reverbs, effects. Uh, let's see. Basically, what, what Jeff is trying to say, it's so, a big box that plugs into your rack, uh, and you plug all of your cables into it. Yes. And you can use an iPad or a touchscreen monitor to control everything in that big box. Yes, and it's truly amazing, and yep. the price is what's uh, what's just killer. And yep. uh, there are um, they also feature uh, to tie in with this uh, Nimbit. Uh, 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 Nimbit is basically like a uh, a social networking engine slash storefront for your personal music or spoken word products. Right. So I mean, if your your church has you know like a contemporary uh, music group, uh, you yourself uh, want to do some solo recording. It's all kind of like in one package, yeah. and we want to say a tip of the hat to Rick Nockvie, who is their uh, 
national marketing director, and he was so cordial. He took us uh, on a, a, a visit uh, into their video production uh, control room, and also they have a really cool um, recording studio. It's a full-blown recording studio. They also have, uh, I, I will say that everything I need to know about their cor- corporate culture is in the signage they have in the building. Um, the first uh, room that we were conducted into to kind of chat a little bit was called the Cone of Silence. Yeah. <laughs> and true. then uh, the name of their big giant boardroom is called Le Boardroom. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they also have this big uh, circular, um, I, I, I want to say it's like a listening room. And it's, it's smack dab in the middle of their work floor. And they're just chairs sitting around it, you know, like yeah. 60s style. <laughs> And uh, there's a television in there and and headsets for everybody so that they can listen uh, and, and a big giant speaker system so that they can listen to to music. Yeah, so but, uh, really they, neat yeah. corporate culture. Yeah, and they and they're just sweet people to deal with. Uh, uh, I have I and they're own people some of products. too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. they're not robots. Exactly. So uh, it's a new uh, RM series. Uh, check out our show notes or just you could check it out at presonus.com yeah. and uh, and dig around. But uh, we we had a good time. Father, have you uh, have you quit sneezing long enough to tell us your pick of the week? I think so. <laughs> yeah, My sure. pick of the week is is actually very simple. Uh, the Nest thermostat is something I've talked about before. That's the kind of very cool uh, thermostat that from the makers of the first iPhone who left Apple, uh, and they they worked with the thermostat, and the thermostat is incredibly good right now. So they decided to move forward, and now they have a smoke detector. Now this is a hundred dollars for a smoke detector. It's a Blimey. lot of money to spend on a smoke detector, but it does smoke. It does. Um, carbon monoxide. It also is a night light that automatically turns on if you're walking around your room, just so you don't trip. Uh, and also, it actually can connect several rooms together, even rooms that are not uh, connected by space. And so, it's it's a remarkably cool device. And on top of that, you can look and you can see very quickly because it reminds you when the batteries are low. And the best part is it has a snooze button. So if it's smart, start smoking, it goes, I sense smoke. <laughs> and you can push the snooze button and you, it basically you're just telling it, I'm frying bacon, leave me alone. <laughs> and it's really, really smart. It's incredibly cool. And it's the next step in kind of getting the, the put together uh, digital house. And so is it necessary? Not even a little bit. Um, but for $100, you're going to spend 35 on a decent smoke detector. You're going to spend another 30 on a carbon monoxide detector. For $30 more, you're getting a pretty cool device um, that's going to work and connect to your Nest thermostat. So if you've already got a Nest thermostat, it's a no brainer, but it's a really cool device. And, uh, and I like it a lot. I tell you what, uh, Nest is really moving. They're moving at what I would consider like the Walt Disney speed. They are they are moving they are moving uh, point by point by point, kind of building little by little by little uh, a really good series of products, and and so I, I really like that. Mm-hmm. Kathleen, uh, apparently you've been watching a lot of YouTube. I have. <laughs> Um, maybe you are familiar with this, but this is my pick of the week. They've been around for a while, but Soul Pancake. Mm-hmm. That's right. Soul Pancake. Fact. Mm. Soulpancake.com. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually run by um, an actor named Rain Wilson mm-hmm. of The Office. Dwight. Fame. Shroot. Yes. Fame. And they have these really cool, just short, inspirational videos. And, and you may have seen the one um, or the couple that are out there with Kid President. Um, this cute little boy who just says, you know, how the world should be. Inspirational things. Yeah. yeah. And so they have a they have a website, soulpancake.com, and it and it gives a little bit about what they're just really all about, you know, getting positive messages out there. Um, they're really cool. Um, the videos are are very well done. Um, they're really fun to watch. I I usually pick one or two when I'm having a bad day, um, and then I send them to my mom, who is also my boss. And my Who principal. may also be having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, and she shares them with the faculty. There's a lot uh, um, out there about teachers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's one that I put a link to, um, and it's it's for um, shoot, what is it? It's like the the twenty things we should say more yes, often. Yes, twenty things we should say more often, and it's like, duh, why don't we do that? Um, and kid president, of course, puts that on. But uh, you can check out their website. You can check out their YouTube um, channel. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very well done. I love it. Everybody needs to pick me up every now and again. Mm-hmm. Even Jeff, who is yeah. always our breath of fresh air. He is. 
Especially okay. on Taco good, Tuesday. Uh, uh, Especially right. on Taco Tuesday. It's Taco good thing. Tuesday. It's Taco good, Tuesday. Yeah. It's a good thing he has breath mints. Yes. Mm-hmm. Better flavor like green tea. Green tea. Uh, I guess it's my turn, isn't it? Is it my turn for the pick of the week? It but is. Chris, what is it that you have picked? Are you, I'll tell you what. Because we got a little bit of time, I'm going to give you three picks. I'm just Whoa. yeah, all at one time. The first one is if you're an After Effects user. Now, this is a very, very small number of people that listen to this show and watch it. After Effects, of course, is the motion graphics software uh, by Adobe. So if you do a lot of motion graphics, uh, I have found a YouTube channel that is really, really cool. It's called Mount MoGraph. So Mount Motion Graph. Mount MoGraph. Okay. And, and, uh, and Matt, who does the, uh, these sessions on his YouTube channel, Mount MoGraph, calls them summits. And at each of these summits, he teaches you how to do something neat in, in Adobe After Effects. So it's basically a free tutorial for learning Adobe After Effects. So if you have shelled out the cash on After Effects and have no idea what it is, um, this is a really good YouTube channel for nice. you. Nice. Uh, the second one is if you were a church history buff and you like analog graphics, like if you like watching the TV commercials where they're drawing things on a whiteboard, my buddy Paul Cat, who teaches school, teaches Catholic, he teaches Catholic school, um, he teaches Catholic school for Catholics, <laughs> uh, he has done a series of church history lessons that he has illustrated in his own singular fashion. And so uh, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, by the way, yep. is that his real name, Paul Cat? Paul Catalanado. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. All right. Yeah, so you'll, you'll kind of want to call him Paul Cat. Uh, and then, of course, my, my other analog pick of the week is, uh, I've talked about him before, my favorite Disney duck artist, Don Rosa. Yes. S- someone in Great Britain uh, has begun... Uh, compiling all of his works into volumes. And so I am now possess the Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck Son of the Sun Volume 1 of Don Rosa's art library. Uh, a lot of his comic books that, that he began to write and draw, they're being compiled. So if you like good art, good storytelling, something that is kid-friendly, but that will also make you happy, um, we'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. Of course, we'll be ordering this internationally, but I think they offer free shipping from the book depository. And again, it's uh, it's volume one of the Don Rosa Library. So that's my pick of the week. That's my picks I know. of the week, yeah. folks. And I love that trio of picks, uh, by the yeah, way. Yeah. And uh, how about that? Show yeah. and tell on radio. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I love it, it. It is, in fact, a book uh, for those of you who are listening live. Yeah. Um, and of course, Kathleen, I'm the host, so I get to do as many picks of the week as I want. Hey, Okay. <laughs> she was pouting there because she had like seven, and she only gets to do the one. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, Jeff, uh, you know, we don't pout because we are always taken care of by those who not only pray for us, but also who provide for us financially. Yes, indeed. Portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. We oui, absolument. If you wish to uh, find the show notes that accompany this episode, if you want to know more about what our podcast does, uh, the fact that we're still on the air <laughs> despite all of this, uh, you can head over to catholicunderground.com. You can find ways to connect with us on Twitter and Facebook. Find out whenever we're live in the chat room. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He is at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. Thank you for hosting us. Oh, you know I do. <laughs> and, of course, Jeff Blackwell is the tech director for the CU. He's the ruling despot at the Blackwell Communications oh, Group, yeah. jeffblackwell.us. And on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellis. Thank you, Jeff. It is an honor and privilege, Father. Kathleen Lee is the faith ninja, and she joins us, as she always does, in her own inimitable style, <clears throat> at, at Kathleen Y-A-B-R on yep. Twitter. I'm there. Totally. There I am. And uh, Mary Kate Taylor is there. She uh, moves objects with her mind. You know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. You can join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We are Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gone Digital. And we will see you next time. Catholic Underground.